In a previous video, I showed you my 1967 Silver Shadow Rolls Royce. And we talked about some of the issues it has. And I wanna get some of these things addressed and fixed, but it's been a heck of a journey. I can't seem to get anybody to help me. <laughs> All right, so here I am under the car. Uh, for the first time, I've never been under this car. I've never seen uh, the inner workings of this car. So let's have a look together and see what's under here. First impressions, pretty good. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of rust here. There's just a little bit of like chipping along this front area, but this car is a pretty rust-free car. I'm seeing various little hoses and pipes that are overflows, I guess. First thing I notice is how wet this is, and my steering linkage there is a bit, you know, the boot is uh, loose, but the steering has been really good in the car. I think that's just that boot. And I'm seeing a little bit of red fluid there, which is, I would assume, transmission fluid, but maybe, oh, you know what it is? There's transmission fluid in the power steering. It just uses ATF. Uh, I'm looking around the bottom of the oil pan, and it's obviously wet. Um, huge starter up there got some engine numbers there wow look at this oil or this spigot there's a spigot up there i mean i wouldn't imagine that's for oil maybe it's for coolant i need to find out <laughs> more i've never been up under one of these now this is wet with trans fluid and i i don't know if this is a cooler or what this little tank is it says birmingham on it i need to wipe it off um, I noticed these couple of, like this hose looks like it went to something and then was disconnected. See that one right there? And then that, I, ooh, I don't know where that went. If that's made to just hang there and drain. Interesting. Interesting. I'm not seeing a lot of seepage around the seal of the trans pan, but there's clearly fluid potentially leaking out. And it could be that my... Fluid leaks, my trans leaks are just loose connections. You know, there's this little linkage here and that looks like it's a little wet. <clears throat> I'm seeing a little seepage coming off of the speedometer cable right there. And the speedometer cable is a little wonky. That it could just be loose, you know, could be a little seal in there. Now I need to be able to get back here. I need to back the car in or pull it in further because I'm noticing some of the uh, 363 hydraulic fluid leaking out of this little reservoir back here where there's some things and it and it looks to me like it's just simply if I can zoom in from this vantage point it looks like just the connection is leaking so it could be that we've just simply got some loose ends and it might not be that big a deal cuz the car runs and drives great now i was told that and I'm guessing that's the oil filter, and it doesn't look like it's too difficult to get to. I do want to do an oil change on the car. I believe that these two cylinders, there was a guy telling me that these fears, these fears, which are very difficult to remove, they hold pressure for the hydraulic system, but they don't look wet to me. And it could be we're simply losing pressure simply because that connection is loose. What I think I might do is get some brake clean, brake cleaner, and just spray off everything. Uh, some degrees or just clean off all the funk. This exhaust looks pretty good. I was expecting to find some bigger holes here, but looking up in there, you know, like the front of this motor is relatively clean and dry for being whatever, 55 years old or whatever. Um, these knuckles are a little wet, but you know, it's all right. These brakes don't look terrible. I mean, I'm not seeing a lot of seepage around the brakes. The brakes do work. That one's nice and dry. I need to be able to take a look at the back, which, you know, I need to back the car in and take a real good look at the back of this thing. Let's see if I go too far forward. I could probably come forward a little bit more, but then I can't get down. <laughs> so I could probably come forward another foot. But there's some interesting things 
back there I want to check out on the leveling system. But I could see this thing dripping as we're standing here. Could just be just some loose ends. It might not be that big a deal. Or maybe I'm fooling myself, I don't know. Yeah, because I am seeing a little wetness here. And I don't know if that's coming from the linkage there or if it's the gasket. But I've heard that you, the best thing to do is just go through and just tighten everything. Just go through and give everything a turn. It needs it, you know, it happens. I think that's German spec. Good and tight. I'd have to pressurize the system and see if it continues to leak. I'm trying to see where else it's leaking. Hmm. Not much movement in that. So, mm. clean this off. It looks like this is, uh, it says radiator. So, transmission fluids going through here. This must be part of a cooler. I don't know, understand what this little module is for. Maybe just for distribution or building pressure. I don't know. But I know I'm leaking transmission fluid um, from somewhere. And uh, cause when I went to, you know, after the car sat for a long time, it was just basically empty. Not empty, well, I mean, I put a couple of quarts in it. So it does leak trans fluid, you know. And I don't know if the power steering and trans share the same port, but I'm trying to figure out, okay, where is all this transmission fluid coming from? I was told that these cars don't have a rear main seal. Um, but it's leaking from somewhere. I guess the best thing I can do is maybe start it up and just sit under here and see what leaks. Trying to see if that's leaking out of that actual fitting or rolling down. Looks like it's dripping down from somewhere up above. actually not leaking too bad. It's doing pretty good. And I don't, other than that leak back there. Hmm. So yeah, it seems that nobody works on these cars. I have called just about everybody here in Las Vegas. There's a guy named Ronnie out in California who's an expert in these, but he doesn't seem to be taking any more commissions. He's retiring. He doesn't want to work on the cars. I talked to the car wizard and he says, I won't touch them. Don't even think about it. Even though you're my friend, I still don't want to work on this car. I called a guy named, I think his name is Greg at Silver Arrow um, here in Las Vegas who was recommended to me. I'm not going to say he was rude. He was not rude, but he basically, in uncertain terms, said he refused to work on the car. I said, well, why? And he goes, well, you know, these cars aren't really worth a lot. I know a lot about them. And I go, it doesn't matter what the car's worth. What matters is what I'm willing to put into the car. The body of this thing is basically perfect. There's like no rust on it. The interior is great. The motor runs well. Uh, it runs perfectly, actually. It just has a few leaks and a th few things that need to be addressed. And uh, I understand it's gonna be expensive. I'm not poor. Uh, I'm willing to work on the car. And he refused. He goes, I refuse to work on your car. 
Have a good day, sir. Like, really? You can't seem to find anybody that works on these Rolls Royces. I tell you, if you want to go into business making some serious money, learn how to work on these old Rolls Royces because there are 10,000 of them out there and every one of them need work. And the reason you can pick up one of these old Silver Shadows so cheap is because every one of them have issues that need to be addressed. The leaky systems and the, you know, all these things and no one will touch the car. So what happens is the car sits and then it continues to deteriorate and then it gets worse and worse. Luckily for me, this is a high mileage car. This car has 88,000 miles on it. And the nice lady that owned it for, since it was new, took really good care of it. And so last couple of years it's been neglected and we're trying to rectify that. So anyway, trying to figure out uh, somebody who can help. We did talk to a Mercedes-Benz repair shop here in town that might be able to help us. But basically, if you had an old Citron or if you have an old Rolls Royce, who do you go to? Who will help you? And I've been watching all these YouTube videos of guys that work on these cars like Harry's Garage and Turrell's Classic Workshop and, and all these different ones that I'd like to mention. And it seems like the only way to get these cars fixed is to fix them yourself. There's only two or three places, it seems like, in the whole country that'll work on one of these cars. And the biggest problem is that what these mechanics all seem to tell me is that it's not so much the cars themselves, it's just the unrealistic expectations of the owners because they're like, no matter what we do to this car, it will never be perfect. No matter how much work we put into it, it's never gonna be as perfect of a car as you want. And I said, bro, I have owned over 40 DeLoreans. I work on these cars all the time. And I tell my customers who spend a lot of money on these cars, no matter what we do to that car, it's never going to be a perfect car. It will, you, you could restore the whole car and on the way home, something breaks. Because it's a DeLorean. It's an English and French car. Hello, English and French car. This has got a, a French Citron hydraulic system that operates the shocks, the brakes. And when it works, it's great. But when it doesn't work, drippity drip. So the Rolls-Royce 363 fluid that I've shown you before, uh, I think I have some over there. It, it's about 20 bucks a quart. So the thing is, I told the guy, I said, look, I understand that no matter what, it's always gonna leak. He goes, look, if you park it on a hill wrong, it's gonna leak. It doesn't have a rear main seal. I go, I understand. That over there under that cover is a 1963 Cadillac. It has a blow tube out of, coming out of the engine that just blows oil out of it. You gotta put oil in it. That's what you do. 50s and 60s Cadillacs and cars, you gotta put oil in them. That's just what happens. You know, like my, my old tour bus had that Detroit diesel 8V92. You just got to put oil in it. It's going to blow the oil out. You just got to keep putting oil in it. So I understand. I go, look, so maybe I got to fill it up with fluids every once in a while. That's just the nature of the beast. I need to get the air conditioning working, and I'd like to just get some of these other issues addressed. He refused to work on the car. And I said, look, bro, I'm not poor. I, I, I have, I will pay. <laughs> He goes, the cost of the repairs may exceed what you paid for the car. I go, I'm fine with that. If at the end I can have a decent car. His confidence level though, as a mechanic, he feels like he's just not gonna be able to uh, satisfy my needs. And um, his, that's his experience working on the cars. And I guess the bottom line is that like, you know, if you're just not that really good of a mechanic, uh, and you know that no matter what you do to the car, it's just not gonna, like I'm not saying he's a bad mechanic, but obviously he doesn't have the confidence in himself to work on this car and feel like I'm gonna be satisfied with it. Little does he know that I'm, I'm happy kind of with it the way it is. If I could, you know, I don't mind putting fluid in it every once in a while. I just need everything to work. I need it to stop. Um, and I need air conditioning in Vegas. So that's where the car sits for, you know, six or eight months out of the year, I can only use it for like four months uh, while it's cool. And that's just not gonna fly. I need the air conditioning work. And that's probably something that any, maybe any air conditioning shop can do. They could just replace those seals and they may wanna convert it over to 134. I'd rather put 12 in it. So uh, I'm trying to work with some people. You know, I even told Car Wizard, I'll ship this thing to Kansas and you can fix it. He goes, no, I don't want this thing. But actually, this car is in really, really good condition, especially for what I paid for it. 
and um, compared to the other ones I've looked at, you can pick up these old silver shadows, 5,000, 10,000 bucks. I see them all the time. I highly recommend you don't do it though, unless of course you are a competent mechanic. The people that I've been seeing working on these things out in the UK and wherever, they are competent mechanics and they have access to parts. That's another thing people always jump to immediately. They go, oh, there's no parts, there's no parts. There's actually a lot of different places in the UK, uh, flying spares and uh, intro car, I think it's called, different places where you can get the parts. There are parts available and so many of these cars have been broken down for parts. Um, it's not an expensive car. But if you find one that's really well sorted in one of the later versions of the Silver Shadow and the Silver Shadow 2, you could pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for a well sorted car. Um, so what to do? I either got to teach myself how to become a Rolls Royce mechanic or I got to find somebody who's willing to do it. Very disappointed with um, the people that I reached out to. Had to run on down to Harbor Freight to get this ridiculously huge uh, hex Allen socket that goes to the, uh, the oil pan. It requires this big, huge Allen head. Of course, $600 later, only I'm stupid enough to buy a Icon hammer. I didn't think I was that stupid. I am that stupid. I, I can't even defend myself. Harbor Freight. I'm gonna need a little help before I go on this uh, adventure changing this oil, so it's back. The McRib. Look at this sloppy mess. And that's what I'm gonna be in the middle of when I let that oil go. A sloppy mess. Don't judge me. All right, it's a, it's like a day later after the McRib incident. It's been really, really cold here in Vegas. And um, I went and bought one of those diesel kerosene heaters. That's what you hear roaring in the background. They're loud. But at least it's tolerable in here. It's been like 30 degrees, something stupid cold. Not 30, but in the 30s. And I just didn't feel like coming out here. Um, it was cold. So now I got the diesel heater running. I'm gonna try to run some voice isolation software to bring the noise down so I might sound a little weird in the video. But anyway, uh, I ran the car a little bit to warm it up, not too much. And um, I'm gonna pull this pin, which we, uh, went to Harbor Freight to buy this big giant set. This is like a half inch, let's see. Gosh darn, bigger than that. 916. No! Metric? You would assume it's metric. However, a lot of the other things on the car have not been metric. Unless they're just crazy weird. Let's try a metric. I bought both. Not stupid. So that's 12. Too small. Wait, 12, 14? Don't tell me. No 13. Guess what size it is? Assholes. Seriously? Try this again. Nine sixteenths. This half will work, providing 
It's not too tight. Oh, God damn it. I bought all of these for nothing. Now I see that when when you go on the old Rolls Royce websites like Flying Spares and whatever, they sell a drain plug. Now I know why. Seriously, what it is is a 13 millimeter Allen head that doesn't exist. Seriously. So one thing I could do if I really wanted to, which I don't, is I could take one of these bits, whichever one seems like it fits the worst or best, take it over to the grinder and make it fit. Or I could go to the tool store tomorrow and see if I can find the correct size bit. There's a little bit of play in this. Let me, I'll give it a little shot. Wow. I don't know if I trust this. Seems like it's in there pretty tight and it's probably been there for a long time. I'm gonna need a little bit bigger wrench, I think. And I don't wanna put a power wrench on this thing. I don't trust it. I think the smarter thing to do is to go get the proper fitting. I'm gonna try anyway, before I screw this thing up. Because if it's tight and I strip it, I am screwed. And I may have to order a special tool from Rolls Royce in England. Son of a bitch. Tomorrow, uh, I'm gonna run over to McFadden Dale's here in Las Vegas, one of the greatest tool stores in the world, and uh, see if they have a 13 millimeter Allen, or whatever size that's between a half. And a <laughs> I don't think there is one, because that's clearly what it is. If that doesn't work, I will have to sacrifice one of these Allens and grind it down till it fits. Well, this was a big waste of time. Came down to McFadden Dales on Decatur here in Vegas. They usually have every single tool and piece of hardware you can ever think of, but they didn't have this tool. We did some research and found out that it's, it's like a particular British size. It's like, I don't know if they had metric back in the 60s, but it's called a, like a 0.525. So it's basically half an inch plus a little extra. I can either I can order one of these. I'm gonna have to order one. Nobody in town's gonna have one of these. And, um, you know, I'm really disappointed because this, this hardware store is fantastic. They generally have like everything. And what's worse is while I was standing in line, I got whamageddon. Already it's, it's the first of December. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. The very next day, you gave it away. This year. <laughs> Looking online, these guys, Rolls Royce, Silver Shadow. It's a point five two five. Never heard of that. I was reading the description, though. British Tool Works were the only people who make this. But then I saw something that they, that they said here. 
that said there's a multi-tool in your toolkit that is supposed to be used to remove the sump plugs, but often go missing. Wait a second. I was just thinking, I, I think I have the original toolkit that came with the car. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I, I had it all along. Holy crap. Look at that. Wow. What does it say? Wow. Gosh darn it. I have the original toolkit that came with this car. Multi-bit screwdriver. A gap gauge, I think that's what that is. I guess that's a adjustable spanner. Amazing. These original light bulbs. Tire checker. A little wrench here. Huh. Doesn't say Rolls Royce on it. Bristol. I can't believe it. Here it is. Son of a bitch. I don't know why I didn't think of it. I, I didn't even think about it. I forgot that I had the original toolkit that came with the car. You almost never have those things. And I wouldn't have thought that something like that would have even, even been in the toolkit. But there it is. I went all over town and I was this close to ordering the tool online. And then I read in the description he goes, if you've lost the original tool that came with your toolkit, I'm like, toolkit? Wow. All right, I warmed up the car. It's nice and warm. Let's try this tool. Okay, good luck. This time I got a breaker bar. Wow. There's a lot of movement at the bottom of this pan. I don't like that. There we go. There we go. Okay, it's loose. Now we've all seen these old drain videos where it's impossible to drain without making a mess. Now what I'm worried about is there's no screen at the bottom of this funnel. If I fumble and drop this damn thing, fishing that tool out of there is gonna just, like right now, if it were to fall, I'd be so screwed. Get this towel ready. Okay. Wow. What a huge hole. <laughs> I mean, look at the size of that st stream. At least it's not splashing. Look at the size of that thing. Wow. Huge. My greatest fear is that there's more oil in that thing that I bargained for. I'm spilling out of this 20, 30 gallon cook. Because there's oil already in there. I'm trying to clean this plug off and it's pretty gnarly. Now, if I was really smart, which I'm not, I would go find one of these threaded bolt. The chances of finding a bolt like this is just not gonna happen. 
like an Ace Hardware. All right, I'll just leave that tool on there because it's not coming off. And I'll just set it up here so I don't lose it. Okay, happy with that. Now the, uh, the real pain in the ass is going to be this, and and I'll have to just show you a close up of this. This oil filter has a drain on the bottom of it to get the oil out of it because it holds a good pint all by itself. And then I don't, you know what? I don't think that comes off. I think only the bottom cap comes off, and then that cartridge goes up in there. So I think I'll just let this drain for a while until there's really no more in there, and then I'll put the cap back in. So I'm just going to let that be for a bit. Let it be. Let it be. Here's this oil filter. It looks like just the end of this comes off. We're going to find out in just a second here. Check out the crazy A-arm suspension of this thing. They start here up front, go all the way back to here, and then all the way back. So it's like, you know, as a wishbone suspension, normally, normally it would just be like right here. It, it, it goes all the way to the very front of the vehicle. So the frame, the frame goes all the way to the very beginning, the front, right under the radiator and then comes all the way back here. The amount of travel that that, that that thing has. You know, and then you've got multiple little ball joints that connect here to here. So that goes down to this and then up to there. And then you've got this anti-sway up front. You really start to get a grasp of, of why these cars ride the way they do. Because you have a, directly in the center of the hub, you have a shock, right? That absorbs this up and down. But aside from that, you have, you know, an additional, in the entire subframe sits on like there's an entire other mounting system here. So this entire, this entire subframe is floating under the body. It's quite fantastic. It's simple. It's, because then you have this other huge support that runs across. It's connected to. This is really intricate. I mean, this is 1967 they put this together. I mean, the amount of connections for these front wheels is, is really amazing. I mean, the points of contact are like, you know, and then there's another, like, wishbone sitting up there. So you've got, like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine, ten, eleven. There's like a dozen points of contact per wheel. It's pretty impressive. And this thing's still tripping. Look, we're gonna be here all day waiting for this thing to drain. I've already put another washer on this thing. Let's just go ahead and plug it up because this thing will be sitting here dripping for days. And I think it'll be fine. Oh wow, that's really not tight. I like how this is positioned directly over the exhaust pipe. Matter of fact, I'm going to throw this rag over these exhaust.
Oh, there it is. There's the oil. There's the oil we seek. I'm sure right now there's some Rolls Royce mechanic looking at me going, No! No, stop! Stop what you're doing now, please! Still dripping. The sun bitch is still dripping. Oh shit, something just fell. Oh no. Oh, something else just fell. God damn it. I have no idea what just fell in there. Here's a spring. Maybe there was another spring, or maybe just some kind of a metal washer of some sort, but there's oil everywhere, just everywhere. I don't think you realize how big of a problem this is, because whatever fell down this hole is at the bottom of this can. I'm pretty sure there was a metal bushing that sat at the base of this thing because I could kind of see where it sat. And that metal bushing probably held that spring into place. Because I, I think I felt it come loose. And that metal bushing is now at the bottom of that oil tank. All right, so a lot of time has gone by in between these clips. I had to go find some kind of a vessel to I had to get the oil out of this can. It holds 20, 30 gallons of oil and it was full. And the parts had fallen into the can. I had bought a transfer pump from Harbor Freight. That didn't work at all, which is sucking air. Could not get it to work. I tried an electric pump I had. That didn't work. It wouldn't lift oil. So I ended up running around trying to find jugs, empty jugs, like emptying one fluid into another kind of a jug so that I could find these jugs to put oil in and then I couldn't find a cup or a ladle to get the oil out I ended up using one of my you know like cheap Tupperwares not a Tupperware but a, you know like a pitcher and I got about uh, five six seven and a half or something gallons out of this thing enough that I could get my hand down in there and fish around and find the uh, this thing it goes to this spring, sits in there like that, okay? Now, here's the deal. I couldn't figure out exactly how the old filter housing was supposed to go back together. So what I ended up doing was watching, you know, like searching the net, watching a bunch of videos. And if you are a Rolls Royce Silver Shadow owner, or whatever, and you are watching this video for the purpose of learning how to do it correctly. I sure hope I have this right. So, uh, you know, I search all kinds of forums. I spent hours, and there's no internet down here in the pit, so I had to go back in the house. You know what? You gotta be shitting me! You couldn't see what just happened there, but that rubber washer just fell into the vat of oil! And it's rubber, I can't get it out with a magnet. I'm so frustrated with this piece of shit! Okay, a lot has transpired. I just shot a video and then I'm re-editing it. I'm reshooting it again because I got it wrong. Okay. I had to empty out the oil vat with a little tricky cup into a paint can and then fish around in there. Good news is I found the washers and things I was missing. 
I've covered it up. It's out of the way. It's out of here. Now, this thing's very complicated. I've went and watched some videos. I've looked at some diagrams. And even looking at them, they're still confusing. And one of the things that was confusing me is this little seat that goes on the spring. I forgot where I put it. It had a, oh, here. It had a, a cork seal washer that sat in there, which looked almost like brass to me. I realize it's cork. That comes out. We're going to talk about that in a second. We'll get to it, okay? I'm fairly confident I have this figured out this time. So we disassemble this so we can do it again. Because I shot this video once, and I realized that I had something wrong, and I didn't want to correct myself, just in case somebody's watching this as a point of reference. Okay, you got your filter housing. It's empty. There's nothing attached, okay? Let's start with our bolt. Remember, you've got your little brass or your, your little whatever metal that is, your, your little washer that has the rubber seal in the middle of it. Now, I talked about it, in fact, I'm gonna reuse my old one because it actually fits better than the new one they sent me. I hope that isn't a failure, but it looks good. Make sure this is clean. Insert that into filter housing, okay? Next, rubber washer seal. Fits very tightly, almost like it's not gonna fit, but it does. You want it to be that tight. It goes all the way down. It's gonna seal the bottom there, okay? You should have a, another metal washer steel, I imagine, right? That's gonna sit on top of that rubber washer so that the next thing that goes on doesn't pinch it, the spring. The spring goes on there, but let's talk about the spring for a moment. Because this is what was throwing me off. This goes into the spring that way. However, <clears throat> with your old filter, you're going to get this little rubber cone, right? Now, at first, I thought that the cone went down, but it doesn't. That cone rests into the butt of the filter there. Gosh darn it. This particular cone shaped bushing has been a pain in my ass. Now your original one, like mine, like I'm not sure, I'm sure the oil was changed at some point, but I'm not sure when they replaced that part from cork to rubber. But this is what we wanna do. So if you're paying attention, let's catch back up again. So oil filter housing, okay, spring goes in, then, before we put this metal bushing on, this is what I was trying to do before I dropped the damn thing. This rubber has to be seated into the top of this, right? I wish I didn't have black gloves on so you could see a little better what I was doing, but when you're finished with it, see it has to, you gotta help it a little. It should be like that. This is replacing the little piece of cork that used to be there. It's gonna be a much better seal. Okay, but you gotta remember though, when you try to put it on the shaft, it's gonna to wanna to come off, right? So you're gonna to have to help it. There we go. That, see it come loose. And that's what I was worried about. So once you get it past the threads, you're gonna to wanna to help it a little bit. There we go. Give a little help. Make sure that it seats onto that little cup. Look down in there, make sure it's in there because if it's sideways, you can have a problem. What a pain in the ass. I highly recommend, and I'm gonna mention this in another part of the video then, if you are watching this video because you own a Silver Shadow or one of these eras, post-war, pre-80s, Rolls Royces, go to Fly and Spares, Intro Car, wherever, any of the people that sell the replacement kits, go ahead and order an old-fashioned filter kit just in case the spin-on replacement doesn't work properly for some reason. 
but also make sure that you've got the tool to remove, your plug, and then buy the replacement plug that's just a regular one without that thing, and replace this stupid system. Okay, filter. Now you would think from the shape of this thing that it goes like that, doesn't? The pointy bit goes up top. Okay, and you'll find that, you know, when you look up in here, it'll make sense where it sits. Okay. That was actually way easier than I thought it was going to be. Now, I forgot to mention, I did put a seal. There is an O-ring that goes up in there. I already put it in. I'm sorry I didn't show that to you. But I have just been through hell and back. But there is a rubber seal up in there. See if I can't get you a better angle of this, but I think that's as good as it's gonna get. I'm not sure how much torque to give this. I gotta say it wasn't super tight when I took it off. You know, you've got the rubber and the springs and all of these cushy things. I mean, you've got a rubber, you know, probably an eighth inch uh, thick rubber seal around the housing that it's resting on. Then there are multiple other rubber seals. And then this is a bit of a crush washer. So I, you know, it didn't require a lot of torque to get it off. I'm going to go, I'm just going to go with, with German spec, good and tight. I think it's fine. Now let's get out from underneath this thing. Finally. Uses 2050. It's regular oil, no synthetic. Not gonna put synthetic in there. Just basically Harley oil. Same stuff I put in the DeLorean actually. Regular old castor oil is what it calls for. I am king! Just put in like five quarts and it's not even on the tip. But this is not a paid endorsement, okay? I like the C Max. I use this stuff all the time. I put it in all my engines. How do you really know if this stuff works? You don't. But I've told this story before. I had this in the generator of my tour bus, and I always put it in every oil change because it was under a lot of high load and high temp, and it ran for weeks at a time. We had an incident where the oil filter plug fell out, all the oil came out, and the engine was running for I don't know how long on no oil. I heard it rattling, and I uh, stopped to check it, and I checked it, there was like no oil in it like very little at all. And it was in Arizona and it was in like the hot part of, you know, it wasn't that hot, but it was not cool. And I, uh, actually what we had was like a spigot, right? And the spigot had come open and the oil came out. So I tightened that down, filled it back up with oil and it ran fine for another year. And I have to say, maybe it's because of the stuff. So, you know, it's like 17 bucks a bottle put it in and you know I don't always believe in all these miracle oil treatments but I put it in every engine every time and it, it definitely gets rid of a lot of nox and paint it mixes with the oil it bonds with the metal and uh, all I can tell you is that generator ran with no oil in the summer for I have no idea how long maybe hours 
can always put the stuff in, and the engine was fine. Again, not a paid endorsement, but another product that I've always used in these kind of engines that use a thick oil like 2050, especially high mileage oil engines, is the Lucas oil stabilizer, and this is the stop leak. And um, this stuff here, it's, what sucks about it is like, it takes a really long time to, to drain. I mean, it might sit there, I don't know how long before it finally goes in there. But these old motors that have high oil capacities, especially running out here in the desert where I live in Las Vegas, this stuff just leaves a nice thick coating. Maybe that's why they're all so thick and gummy. It's probably had some of, their in, some of that in there. Uh, I've just always used this stuff. It's never done me wrong. I've never actually had an, oil, an engine fail. It's always something else, transmission or whatever. But I have always put these, this combination of things into my engines. And uh, I've never had an engine blow. You know, I've never experienced a full engine failure. I think I'm gonna give it a quick start. Let it uh, cycle. All right, let's start it up. Go down there and see if we spot any leaks. I don't see anything coming from that oil filter at all. Nothing from the drain. I mean, it's going to have its regular leaks. <laughs> Nothing I can do about that. Alright, I don't expect this thing to run or drive any differently. Because it was actually running really well before. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's not going to hurt it to have a nice fresh oil change. So, we'll take it for a quick little ride. Made a trip over to the local fuel station. Last time I filled it up, I put about 17 or 18 gallons in. And it said it had fuel in it, and I thought it did. So, I don't know what the tank holds, 20, 25 gallons? I, I need to find out. I've got about 57 miles since I filled it up, and I just put in another eight and a half gallons, which means it's getting about seven miles a gallon. Seven to eight miles a gallon. I have been letting it idle a bit, you know, uh, but let's go with eight, eight miles a gallon. Uh, city, because <laughs> I haven't been on the highway. So that's what I'm getting, and so, which means it's running terrible. Or is it? Maybe it's running great. I don't know. I don't know what the miles per gallon is in this car. It's not, it's smiles per gallon, as they say. It's yards per gallon. Um, pretty terrible. But at least you got a huge tank. I wonder if any of the jets landing here at the airport have Rolls Royce engines in them. Well, if they do, you can be sure that they're leaking. Oh, is there anything cooler than cruising through Las Vegas in a Rolls Royce? You know, owning an old Rolls Royce, it's like having a baby. You're constantly putting fluids in, fluids are coming out, and both of those processes are very messy. But you know, it's kind of worth it. You know, these cars, they require you to be a mechanic or no one because it's like having an old Harley, you know, you, you got to be able to work on this thing. Back in the day, there was probably a pretty good service network for these things, but the modern Rolls Royce dealers that are owned by BMW, well, everybody who knows, like I own a modern Rolls Royce, I own a Phantom and anyone will tell you that these people are pricks. They are not it, you, you are not getting the service you deserve. Oh, sure, when you buy a brand new one, you know, for that first couple of years, oh yeah, they're treating you real well when you spend a half a million dollars for the car. Come rolling in in a 10, 15 year old Rolls Royce, they won't even give you the time of day. They won't even say hello to you. 
because they just assume that you're, you know, like me, some working stiff who went out and bought a nice car and you're not going to want to pay the prices that they charge. I went in to get a key for my Phantom, a second key. It was $1,500 for a key. And if you went rolling in with one of these, they, you know, an old silver shadow like this, you can pick them up for pretty cheap. So they don't get treated with any respect by Rolls Royce. They just don't. And when you reach out to the old guys that still work on them, well, they're all cocky. And they're a bunch of bastards also because they know that they're one of a handful of only people in the world who can work on these cars. And quite frankly, they treat you like crap. I haven't met a single Rolls Royce mechanic specialist yet that isn't an arrogant piece of crap. I could name names, but I'm just, you know, the bottom line is I just haven't met one yet that's nice that isn't completely arrogant and narcissistic and thinks he's God's gift to mechanics. Because he knows he's got you over a barrel and he doesn't want to give you the time of day and he doesn't want to work on your old silver shadow that you're probably not going to pay to fix. Unless, of course, you're like Wayne Newton and you come in with your 1965 Silver Cloud because he has one of those. I've seen it at the shop. And the thing about it is, you know, in order to own one of these cars, you better be willing to get dirty. And here I am, I've got a whole professional shop in oil pit, and it's still a tremendous pain in the ass just to change the oil. When you get into major mechanic work on this car, like redoing the brakes, the hydraulic system, and everything else, man, this is why you've never seen one of these going down the road. You have probably never seen a silver shadow like this just going down, maybe once or twice. I certainly haven't. I had never seen one of these cars in person till I bought this one. And I'd never been inside one till I got this one. I don't know, maybe I'd seen one somewhere, but I'm just telling you, they're not very common. This is the only one that I know of in town. I haven't seen any other silver shadows. I'm in Las Vegas. Here we are, Sin City. I mean, you would think cars like this would be all over the place. Not really. What do you get? What, Hyundais? What is that, a Tesla or something? Kias? It's, you would think there'd be a lot more supercars, and you do see a few here and there, but not like this. So my recommendation to you, if you ask me, should I buy a Rolls Royce, an old Rolls Royce? No, uh, the answer is no. Even if you find one that you think is really well sorted and in good condition, doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way for long. It's, you know, it's gonna require, these things require tremendous amount of work. This car has 88,000 miles on it, has a stack of records, and, and tons of work went into this car. And I'm just very lucky that I've only really put a few hundred miles on it in the couple of years I've had it. And I've just been lucky that the thing runs pretty good, but the brakes are pretty iffy, it leaks like a sieve, the air conditioning doesn't work, you know, most of the windows don't work, and um, it's just gonna need like constant attention. I'm trying to decide how much of that attention I wanna put into it. I've had tons of people contact me, offer me 20, 30 grand for this car, they wanna buy it. And I thought about selling it, but for me to replace it, you know, you could buy one of these things for like five grand, 10 grand, but unless it's a running driving car, I mean, sure, you could spend 50, 60,000 on a well-sorted one. And, um, but the thing is, is that what I've learned about these kind of cars is that even if you have a car that is in conceivably or perceivably perfect condition, it's not gonna stay that way for very long. It's not gonna take long that it's gonna need some kind of maintenance and some kind of work. And so the bottom line is sort of like owning, owning a DeLorean, you kind of have to become an expert in the DeLorean if you wanna own and drive one. It has to be a passion. You have to really want it. It's a lot like women. <laughs> it's a full-time job. Owning a Rolls Royce, a DeLorean, and having a wife. It's a full-time job. It's not something you do lightly. So I'm just putting this out there kind of as a, uh, as a warning, right? It's like Sam Kinison said, what are you going to do? Give sheep the vote? So if you want to enjoy these kind of cars, you're going to have to either be a mechanic yourself or have somebody close to you that is, that doesn't charge much.
Anyway, let's enjoy the Las Vegas trip on this cool December night in a classic 1967 Rolls Royce Silver Shadow. Las Vegas. Go to Denny's. Denny's. We have some of the finest restaurants in the world here in Las Vegas, and there's a Denny's and an IHOP. Who? Why are you going to IHOP and Denny's? Why? Why are you doing that? We have Michelin star restaurants here. <laughs> Here's the world famous gold and silver pawn shop from Pawn Stars. You guys have seen me on that show about five times yep that's where we shoot it there it is here's another piece of trivia fuel for you uh, I was married to my first wife there at Graceland Wedding Chapel <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I regret every minute of it <laughs> Been cruising up and down Las Vegas Boulevard. I've been driving for about an hour. Running great. Purring like a kitten, running cool as a cucumber. This is the plaza. Up there, that was uh, Biff's Pleasure Palace and Back to the Future 2. Oscar's here, which is a restaurant. That actually used to be a swimming pool at one time. Then they made it into a restaurant. This is the back side of Fremont Street. Very cool. I, I didn't catch it on video, but there was a midget Mr. T giving me a thumbs up. I pity the fool.